the Joe Rogan experience. For the average person that is uh, sitting around reading these articles that say don't worry or reading these, ar- these articles that say this is the end of humanity, what, 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 what could these people do? Like what, what could they do and what do they do if they get infected? Well, first of all, uh, neither of those kind of articles are correct. And we right. have to make sure that we get that message out to people that it's there. We need straight talk right now. You know, and, and part of it is it's so hard to – you hear from people who suppose experts, what's this going to happen or not happen? You know, uh, and, and let me just give you an example because we've heard a lot about, well, it's going to go away with the, the, uh, the coronavirus with the seasons. Okay, when it warms up, it'll go away. Well, you know, the other coronaviruses that we have that we've had to worry about was SARS, which appeared in 2003 in China. And when that came out of China in February 2003, it took us a little while to figure out that these people really aren't that infectious till day five or six of their illness. And then they really crash and burn and many of them would die. Um, But what we did was basically, by knowing that, identify these cases in their context quickly. And so if they had symptoms, brought them in put them in these isolation rooms so they wouldn't infect anybody else. And it took until June to bring that under control. That had nothing to do with the seasons. MERS, which is another coronavirus that's in the Middle East, it's in the um, Arabian Peninsula, it, the natural reservoir for that is, is camels. In China, and by the way, SARS, it was palm civets, and we a type of animal food the road, that we got out of the markets there. In the Arabian Peninsula, we're not going to euthanize 1.7 camels, you know, to try to get rid of MERS. And there, it's 110 degrees out, and this virus is transmitted fine, thank you. I mean, it goes from animals to people. It goes in the hospitals. It, there's no evidence that's seasonal there. So that's a good myth to expose right away. This is not something that's going to cure up when it gets warm. Uh, it, you know, if it does, it won't be because there's a model for it. it what will it be? Because how does, a, how does something like SARS run through a population and then stop being around anymore? Well, it wouldn't have, but had we had good public health, had we had, uh, you know, the same kind of transmission we're seeing with this coronavirus where you're infectious before you ever get sick, where you're highly infectious. Remember with SARS, now you didn't really get infectious until you're in six or, you know, six days of illness and you knew that you were in trouble. And then you could isolate you. And we didn't understand that at first and we trans, you know, the virus transmitted. So that's why SARS stopped. MERS stops because we don't get rid of the camels so it keeps hitting humans day after day. But then when they go to the hospital, we no longer allow those individuals to transmit to others in the hospital because we do what we call good infection control. As soon as they get there, they're in special rooms with special masks and all this kind of thing. And so in that regard, uh, these coronaviruses can be stopped. This one's not. As I said at the top of the program, this is uh, like trying to stop the wind. Influenza transmission, you never hear anybody saying in a bad flu- seasonal flu year, um, you know, we're going to stop this one. If you don't have a vaccine that works, you don't. Um, it's just breathing. That's all it is. So what's best case scenario here? Well, I think as I laid out to you before, uh, you know, this could be 10 times worse than a really bad seasonal flu year. And uh, it, I'll grant you it will, it will hit, you know, primarily the older population and those with underlying health problems. But as I mentioned also, you know, we have a lot of people who have other risk factors, obesity, high blood pressure is another risk factor where you can have a really bad outcome with this. And so we don't quite know what it's going to do yet. I think, uh, you know, we've, we've been right on the mark predicting where it's going to be to today. I think from here on out, I can tell you it's going to stay around for months. It's not going to go away tomorrow. We've got to stop thinking about if we just get through tomorrow, that's it. So if we're going to close schools, we're going to tell people not to go into public, we're going to cancel big events, how long are we prepared to do that? What are we going to do? We have to ask ourselves that. I think the big thing is that eventually enough people get infected where it will be like putting reactors in the rods, you know, rods in the reaction, I should say, and then that stops it by itself. But, um, how so? Because if you're – if if Two of the three of us in this room were immune right now to it because we'd had it and recovered and had protection because of natural protection. Then I couldn't transmit to anybody. So that's what's going to happen if you get enough people who get infected. Ultimately, uh, then it'll s- slow down and stop transmission that way. But that's a heck of a price to pay to get there. Is it safe to say that we're fairly fortunate that this isn't something like the Spanish flu or something that's really ruthlessly deadly? Well, uh, that's where I think we have to be really careful. Um, just to back up, about 0.1% of people who get seasonal flu die. And grant you, it's mostly older or younger people, okay? That's one out of 1,000. With this one right now in China, we're seeing between 2 and 3% of the people die. And some say, well, that's way too high. It's not going to be that high. It's going to be lower. Uh, but again, 
uh, and they say that because we didn't pick up all the milder illnesses, okay? Um, but on the other hand, we have a lot of additional people in countries like ours that have even more risk factors for having bad outcomes than China. And so uh, Spanish flu, the one you mentioned, 1918, that was about a 3 to 3.2 percent case fatality rate. Now, it did preferentially impact 18 to 25-year-olds. They, they were the hardest hit group. Yeah, why was that? Well, you know, it has to do with your immune response again. We think that uh, what happened is when this virus got into you, it created what we call a cytokine storm, which is an antibody of response in your body that's out of control. And it basically you destroy yourself. And it sets this thing up to trigger it off. So the healthier people had the more adverse reaction to exactly. it. Exactly. Or the other group that has had a real challenge with that are pregnant women. And pregnant women have a very unique issue. Um, one is, of course, they have some constriction of their lungs just by the very physical mass. But also their immune system is really in, at a heightened state at that point. There's a part of that immune system and that woman says, this is not all me. Get rid of this. It's like a rejection of a graft. And the other part saying, this is the most precious cargo I'll ever carry. You know, I got to make sure I don't lose it. And when that virus got in between those two, it started again that same kind of cytokine storm. Now, the thing that concerns us about this, which we saw in, in, in 1918, I mentioned this 3 plus percent, this one could be as high as 2 percent. So it's somewhere between a really bad flu year at 0.1 percent, and it could be as high up here, you know, getting closer to 1918-like. And that's those numbers I just gave you a few minutes ago from the uh, American Hospital Association of, you know, 480,000 deaths here in this country over the next 6 to 12 months. 